Thank you, Arlie. So, hello, everyone. Hi from Beirut. Uh, it's nice to uh, to to see you, and also and to uh, to be with uh, Arlie and his book launching, and uh, with a great panel as well. Uh, so, I I'm sorry, but my cat is here. I I hope that uh, I mean. Uh, I'll be useful in this in this panel. Uh, uh, first of all, I like to to really I mean mention the book of Arling, uh, which I read it with with great pleasure because it really depicts so much uh, the Palestinian national I mean the Palestinian political movement I would say in, in Lebanon. Uh, we will come to this later maybe. But to come back to your question, Rana, to just to for for the sake of time, um, yes, actually in 2018 uh, it was a parliamentary election, and as uh, as someone working for a long time in uh, in political activism, human rights activism, uh, I mean the idea just came to me to say that I mean Palestinian, as you're saying, that they have agency. And why not uh, to to just uh, claim this agency? So uh, it was, uh, I mean, a momentum to show a model and to engage other Palestinians and uh, saying that uh, we have the right to claim our state. Just to put things in context that Palestinians have been in Lebanon for almost 74 years with no rights at all, uh, no rights to own for housing, I mean, they cannot buy a house. They have no right uh, uh, for uh, for work. I mean, uh, they can work illegally and uh, in some uh, some uh, uh, limited jobs. They they I mean, uh, manual or uh, uh, unskilled job. They can they have the right to work. Uh, they also they have no right to have their own uh, political uh, or cultural organization. Uh, they are completely, I mean, you have laws in Lebanon that uh, they, I mean, laws in Lebanon are, when they mention Palestinians, they mention Palestinians to marginalize them. So they are marginalized by law. They are never, uh, they, we have no law that clear about Palestinians because there is a problem in the legal status of Palestinians. So they are not defined as foreigners and they are not defined as refugees, neither as citizens. So in 2018, the idea came that Palestinians can claim their state, and they can say that we want a seat in the parliament and a mob campaign, that we want to be seen, I mean, and we want to have rights uh, as citizens' rights, uh, social, economic, and cultural rights. Um, and, and, and this would, would it, I mean, to, to give ownership for Palestinians to this, so I had to tour in the camp to explain to them and uh, attempting to have a new narrative, to set a new narrative and a new approach uh, for Palestine. Uh, so this new narrative would say that, okay, uh, we, we as Palestinians, as marginalized groups, as, as refugees, we want to, uh, we advocate for a Lebanon, for a rule of law in Lebanon, because it's only the rule of law that can protect Palestinians and that can protect minorities and refugees. And we want a real transitional justice process in Lebanon, because it's time to stop scapegoating Palestinians and to blame them for all what happened in Lebanon. So, uh, I mean, it was a way that, okay, marginalized can ask for, for their rights and can claim uh, a new state or a new regime and to, to talk about a failing state and that this state is marginalizing everyone in Lebanon, not only Palestinians. So it was, I mean, why not to say that we need a new political system and political regime? And actually what, what's happening currently in Lebanon, it shows that, okay, this is a system that is based on patriarchy, on clientelism, nepotism, and it's not working anymore. And we need a new system where everyone is included, where everyone uh, has, I mean, everyone has equal rights and equal opportunities. So, in a nutshell, it was the, and what the, how the Palestinian respond to it, they, it gave them a lot of talk. And uh, they, I mean, many of those who um, I visited in the Palestinian camp, and I talk, they felt like very proud of it. 
in a way, it, it gives a new image of the Palestinians in Lebanon. Yeah. Uh, actually, I mean, as, as Arling described it very well, uh, unfortunately, the Palestinian uh, communities, they are still dominated by men. And it, it feels really, I mean, during my campaign or, or in, every time I visit the camp or I meet Palestinians, uh, uh, politi uh, like politicians, it feels, I would say, disgusting to see those men sitting with no, I mean, and talking about also not only, I mean, uh, I mean, even they talk that women are not even, I mean, they, they are not able to deal with all uh, this violence in the camp or, I mean, the chaos of the camp. So that's why we need men to deal with that. Uh, I think, I mean, and throughout my campaign, I made it a point to, to uh, we were a group of Palestinian women I mean, I was the space that exposed herself to talk about this. But, I mean, we it was also like a model to show that, no, women are able to develop a discourse and to develop a narrative and a, a working method, and men could be uh, the support system. Or, I mean, in, usually in, in all Palestinian camps, women have a role in everything related to social work but they have no role when it comes to political work because politics is for men and that's how, how they see it and women could be only active socially whereas we have a lot of experience where women, especially like for example I would mention when Ain al-Halwi was destroyed I mean it was the woman who rebuilt the camp and the Palestinian men were uh, in prison with a, an Ansar prison and it was by the Israelis uh, you have uh, recently I mean, uh, when you have demonstration, you have a lot, I mean, all of women who are at the forefront of the demonstration. When you have any fight and you have a lot, you have some mothers who come to solve the fight. So, so women are able and they have, I mean, that's not, I mean, <laughs> this is uh, not debatable, but for uh, when, it, when it comes to talking to Palestinian men, we need to, I mean, <laughs> prove for them that it happened and and women are not lacking capacity or skill. Even during my campaign, I would like to mention this. When I go to the camp, I, I had a lot of talk with women, and especially like very young women. And that was my focus, to show them that you can be, you can talk about Palestine, and you can advocate for the Palestinian cause, regardless of uh, how you look or who you are, because for me, I mean, social change is very important to attempt any political change. I would like to mention some examples. Um, uh, in Badawi camp, for example, you had a lot of, I mean, young women, they were looking at me with my tattoo, with my piercing, and I have a Lebanese accent because my mother is Lebanese. And they, say, they saw me for the first time. They were asking, like, is she Palestinian or Lebanese? Is she Christian or Muslim? Uh, how can she talk about Palestine? Like, look, uh, no, she has a tattoo, she has a piercing. So for me, it was, it was also something important to, like, to provide them with an example that there is something else than what you are seeing in the camp. So it was also an invitation, and I would love for everyone to to just be able to go to to go from the camp, to, uh, like, even outside the camp, so they can. They, they will not be uh, imprisoned by the stereotypes and by uh, which uh, people I mean, and, uh, in the camp try to put in, in, in their head, even though, I mean, a lot of women are, are very, <laughs> very outspoken and uh, they, they, but 
I'm talking about the need to have this social movement when it comes to like really supporting women movement in the camp so they can decide for their own and they can uh, they can like uh, build their own potential because they have a lot of potential that they are not having the space to, to use it. I certainly, I certainly can, but let me first say what a pleasure it is to be in Oslo virtually. Um, I was last there in person three years ago, appropriately enough for Erling's dissertation defense, which clearly went well since, since he has a PhD and he now has, now has a book. And let me also say before I, I answer this specific question, what a, what a terrific book it is, because I think what he's done, which often does not get done, is, is, paint a very complex picture or weave a very complex tapestry. There are the threads of regional politics. There is, there is Palestinian national politics, the, the state of the peace process, the failure of the peace process, other regional actors. There's the social and economic dynamics in, in the camp and its it, it, it situation in, in Lebanon. Uh, and then there's the role of the factions and of the political entrepreneurs negotiating this complex space of both the immediate social environment and, and the broader Lebanese regional and, and Palestinian environment. And, and the complexity of that politics, the richness of that politics, whether it's in a Palestinian refugee camp or in many other places, simply does not usually get articulated uh, because someone doesn't spend the time to go and talk to people and understand all the complex factors which are shaping their lives, but also the agency, also the entrepreneurship, also the action, whether, whether it's a younger generation of activists, whether it's, it's factional leaders negotiating resources and clientelism and so forth. I mean, it, it really is a very, very rich picture. Um, it's like a delicious box of chocolates with many flavors, and uh, I'd like to thank you for, for bringing that to us. Um, your question, however, was, was about UNRWA, and of course we saw it during the Trump administration, the cutting of all U.S. funds for UNRWA. During the Biden administration, they first gave $150 million, uh, they started to give $150 million back to UNRWA in April, then there was $33 million during the last conflict in Gaza, and then another $135 million in July. And a new framework agreement between between UNRWA and the Americans, which has been a bit controversial because there are things in it with regard to uh, those who've received military training can't be beneficiaries of, of UNRWA resources and issues with regard to neutrality and education materials. It's been quite controversial, uh, particularly in, 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 in the camps and in, in the West Bank and Gaza, too. But what does that all mean in terms of, of U.S. policy? And I think here it's really important to separate out what we might call the Trump effect from broader trends. Uh, Donald Trump did not care about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. He did not care about Palestinian refugees. His political in interests were really to align himself with 
uh, a growing mainstream in the in the Republican Party, which is just reflexively supports everything, and particularly the, everything the Israeli right wing says or does. And that's where that decision came from. But there are also these longer-term things which predate the Trump administration. Um, together with my colleague Mick Dumper at the University of Exeter, I ran a simulation for then Commissioner General Filippo Grandi and his senior staff on what would happen if the U.S. cut off funding in 2013, so five years before they actually cut it off. We were having to do serious thought about what happens if U.S. funding ends. How, how would the agency survive the loss of hundreds of millions of dollars in, in assistance? And those broader factors are a failed peace process, zero prospect for any resolution of the Palestinian issue and hence the Palestinian refugee issue within the foreseeable future, within the next five-plus years. Um, donor fatigue. Uh, donors uh, have limited budgets, and, and uh, they don't have unlimited amounts of money. Um, a growing anti-UNRWA campaign during the Netanyahu administration, which got more and more intense. Before that, the Israelis had been ambivalent in that they found some of the utility of UNRWA valuable, even if they didn't like what the agency stood for. But as the, during the Netanyahu prime ministership, it got more and more unfair absolutely hostile to UNRWA's very existence, growing, uh, de sorry, declining salience in, in parts of the Arab world, particularly the Gulf, for whom the refugee issue and the Palestinian issue became less and less important. And then, of course, the refugee population that continues to grow because there's no resolution of the conflict and multiple regional crises, civil war in Syria, you know, repeated conflict in Gaza, um, and now the, the, the Lebanese crisis in all its, its many economic and, and political dimensions. All of that puts the agency in a terrible position. Um, it, it, it never has enough money to do what it wants to do. It's constantly hit by new crises. Even with the U.S. back, the U.S. is not funding at the levels it was before. Many donors just don't know what to do with UNRWA. They give to it every year, but there's not a lot of extra money in the donor system for, for the agency. And I've argued also, you talked about how refugees see the agency as kind of the avatar, the representation of international responsibility for the refugee issue as a symbol of, inter of the international community's commitment to Palestinian refugees. I actually just never thought donors see it that way. I, I've, I've argued elsewhere that donors see it as the avatar of muddling through. That, that, that donors see it as an agency where they can send some money to help put a Band-Aid on bigger problems that they can't or won't fix. And, yes, that's why the Biden administration started money again. They don't want an unstable Middle East. The UNRWA does work that helps reduce social and hence political tensions. They don't know what else to do if there's – conflict in Gaza, they throw oh, another $33 million into the pot, but there is really no strategic thought on the part of the donors what they want the agency to do, and the international community has really fundamentally not come to, the, come to grips with the fact there is no Middle East peace process. I mean, that, that there is, the, you know, a two-state solution is rapidly receding, there's no real replacement for it, we have an apartheid-like situation emerging in terms of Israel's system of control in the occupied territories, and the international community has no vision on how it wants to change that, nor does it necessarily consider it particularly important given other challenges. And that just puts the agency in an awful situation. It can't do all it wants to do. It can't do all that the refugees would like it to do. It will never have enough resources. It will constantly be hit, hit by new crises. And its clients and its donors do not even really agree on what the agency is all about. And it was established in the first place as a temporary agency. So it's a temporary permanent agency, absolutely essential to the lives of many Palestinian refugees, but caught in this, this complex web of you know, competing demands and inadequate resources. And I don't see that situation getting better. And indeed, I think the, the hostile attacks at the, against the agency will continue. I mean, there's a lot of criticism of UNRWA in the U.S. Congress, for example.
I, I, I don't think it's well equipped, but I think it manages, again, I'm going to go back to muddling through. I think it manages to muddle through. I mean, it's caught in a web of, of inadequate resources for refugees. It's caught with its own inefficiencies and occasionally corruption. It's caught in factional politics. That corruption in factional politics sometimes links. So sometimes one of the problems that UNRWA has with anti-corruption measures in Lebanon is the threats it receives indirectly from factions for pursuing anti-corruption measures. Um, I've known senior UNRWA staff to be mailed bullets in the mail when they're trying to investigate cases of corruption in the agency because that corruption is linked to factions. Um, it has resources without authority, although I don't actually think it wants the authority because I think that would be even more problematic. Um, it, it's subject to blame shifting and scapegoating and outbidding because the factions will compete with each other, criticize UNRWA for failing to do things. And at the same time that it's de dealing with this complex set of factors in the camp at a very local level with, as you know, almost all of its employees being Palestinian, um, it is also having to work in the international environment. And it's having to promise things to donors in order to get money to provide any any services. So, again, we see that with the new framework agreement between the United States and UNRWA, in that no assistance is supposed to go to anyone who's received paramilitary training, um, and there's supposed to be a revision of the education program and anti-corruption measures and so forth. If UNRWA doesn't promise that to the United States, it gets no money and clinics close. On the other hand, understandably, the factions are very upset by what they see as U.S. conditions, which they see trying to transform UNRWA cut their own influence, reduce the amount of resources that go to factional members, and so forth. And, and there's no magic answer. And it has to satisfy both constituencies to the best of its ability simultaneously because it can't jettison one. It can't do anything without donors, and it fundamentally is, is an agency that's meant to address Palestinian needs, Palestinian refugee needs. And that's just a very difficult situation, and I don't think it's well-equipped to deal with it, but I, I can't imagine how it would be well-equipped to deal with it. Yeah, I, I can't think of a magical reform which would suddenly how might make make this much easier for UNRWA to, to navigate.
I mean, those events uh, were so much uh, uh, marking uh, the, like everyone uh, around the world, not only Palestinian refugees in Lebanon, uh, but for uh, Palestinian refugees, I mean, it, uh, it kind of like uh, made us alive again that we're not only making the headlines, because Palestinian cause has been forgotten for a long time, especially after, like, all the, the wars in the world and the Syria crisis. And uh, so, but it only shows that Palestinians are not a group of refugees. They, it shows the unity of the people of uh, Palestine. Uh, because before, we were kind of, okay, I mean, we feel like we're, um, a group of different refugees, like refugees in Syria, Palestinian refugees in Syria, in Lebanon, in Palestine. Uh, but uh, I mean, with, with the recent uh, with the recent movement, uh, it, it it elaborates how Palestinians are like. No, there are people. I mean, it's it's a, it's a people who share the same concern. We have the same cause. And we can be unified, and we can uh, we can be like uh, it's not a, it's not a solidarity movement, but we felt again we felt that oh I mean we're we're not refugees we have an agency again. Uh, it's also I mean it, it it was very important to see new faces, um, uh, and and uh, like people and new faces with integrity, like uh, Muhammad al kurd and his sister. So also this, this uh, gave us hope that uh, we're still able to have people who can, uh, who can hold the flag of the Palestinian cause and can speak for the Palestinian cause from a very, uh, uh, from an ownership approach and from an integrity and, and like just present the case uh, also from an equal, uh, like, uh, equal to, uh, to the international community uh, and to the Israeli uh, discourse, in a way. I mean, it's, uh, um, it, it also shows uh, how the Palestinian authority is, uh, is so weak when it comes to caring and to, uh, to, to, to advocate for, uh, like, the Palestinian rights, and like, including refugee rights, which we know for sure that, I mean, I mean it's, a, it's a card that they have dropped for a long time. But still, I mean, all of this show us, I mean, we're, we all, I mean, Palestinians are living on hope, unfortunately, uh, but of hope is important to keep going. Because we have no leadership, we have a crisis of leadership. So, so all what we focus on is that oh, okay, we're, we're able to make it to the next level. We're still able to make it to the next level. It also shows, uh, like I would mention Abu Ubaida uh, from the Hamas uh, movement, who was in Gaza talking, and uh, and who creates fear for the Israelis. And it shows also his credibility. You know that we need young people that they don't have position and they don't, they are not known, but they can uh, build a new narrative. And they, I mean, we, I mean, it shows how much we're thirsty for new figures, young figures who can create trust and who can build trust.
I mean, I, I think I think leadership is important, but we have a fundamental crisis of, of leadership. And, and we saw that in the, the cancellation of, of the elections that were supposed to occur in, in, in Palestine this year. I mean, Fatah is in complete disarray and, and fragmenting. Um, Hamas was clearly a political beneficiary of the protests in Jerusalem and, and the, the kinds of violence which follows. The polling all shows that. But I don't think that's terribly helpful because I think they're very much a dead end in terms of moving to a better place in, in terms of the Palestinian situation. Um, I think in some ways their strength helps Israel rather than hurts it because then there's no pressure on Israel to do anything. We have a new Israeli prime minister who's openly saying, no, no Palestinian state, no, we don't want to talk about it. No, not on the agenda, just not interested in it. And there's no backlash whatsoever. I mean, a, a few Democratic members of Congress briefly tried to hold up some military assistance to Israel, but that didn't go anywhere. Um, and, and so in many ways, um, I mean, I'm, I'm very, very depressed. I, I think the Palestinian polity is in a serious situation. I don't see any alternative leadership emerging that becomes a national leadership with organizational strength as opposed to a protest moment for the period. I don't see any paradigm shift. I'm not sure what the new paradigm would be. Um, I, I don't think this is an easy answer. I don't think there's an easy thing for, for the Palestinian national leadership or for the PA to do that improves their situation. I think we've settled into a situation where Israeli prime ministers, and Nate Netanyahu, used, Nate Netanyahu used to have to pretend he was in support of a two-state solution, and now we have a government that openly says, nah, no, we don't think so. Uh, let's talk about something else, and, and gets away with that. And I just don't see what the pressure point is. I don't think the Gulf cares much. Um, I mean, we were lucky that the Gulf gave it a little more money to UNRWA when, when the Trump administration pulled out, but that was just because of the Qatari-Saudi rivalry. It had nothing to do with Palestine. It had everything to do with the Qataris and the Saudis and the Emiratis trying to outbid each other. Um, I don't see the international community doing anything. Uh, the, interna the International Criminal Court in investigation continues to trickle through, which I think is a quite useful thing, um, because if it ever does become a proper indictment, I think it will remind us of some key international legal principles. I don't see any really fundamental pressure on Israel. And I think this is why we've seen Human Rights Watch, we've seen Big Salem, and there was a new survey of Middle East experts, which they said the same thing, that, that the, the short version of was in the Washington Post a few days ago, uh, where it ended up to a situation of apartheid. We've ended up with a, in the territories, we've ended up with a situation of permanent or semi-permanent structured institutionalized inequality with millions of disenfranchised Palestinians. And I, I do not at this point know how we move out of that. Now, taking it back to Lebanon, what does that mean for Lebanon? Because we have Palestinians in Lebanon faced with a completely dysfunctional uh, national struggle, which is stuck in this really bad place. And a completely dysfunctional Lebanon, which, as we know, the World Bank has said is one of the three worst economic declines of the last 150 years in the entire world. And as someone who also works on Lebanon, I, I'm, I can't say I'm more optimistic about the ability of the Lebanese elite to solve the Lebanese crisis than I am optimistic about the international community to fix the, the, the Israel-Palestine issue. Uh, I mean, hooray, we have a new Lebanese cabinet, but it should be remembered that the prime minister had to cut his statement short in case the power went out in the middle of the parliamentary session, which I think was encapsulating the situation in Lebanon right now. So, you know, I, I think that's a very difficult situation. And then we have ordinary people trying to survive. We have political leaders trying to adjust. We have new generations and new, uh, new activists trying to find a space in there to make a positive difference in it, and I think they can um, and that and that is the situation we're in. So it is, you know, if, if you invited me to, to say something really optimistic, I, I I would be lying if I was optimistic right now. I, I think we're in a very depressing place on, on both fronts. But that doesn't change the ability of ordinary people at the grassroots to make changes in their environment and to mobilize in ways that are positive. So we should never let the dark skies obscure the fact that at local level people can do things to, to change perceptions, to put in place services, to provide hope and inspiration for people locally, to solve local pro problems, to articulate their views. So this isn't a reason to be discouraged from activism, but it is a very difficult situation right now.
Yeah, uh, I I totally agree with uh, with Rick about uh, not to, I mean there is no not a very rainbow image, but uh, still I mean uh, as he said I mean we we always keep hope that uh, the grassroots level can at least uh, change in their uh, make a change in their environment. And here I want also to talk about uh, yes I definitely hope that Palestinians can make a change, not on a structural level on, or a political leadership level, but yes, I mean, at least they should be given the chance. And that's why when I claimed and when I started the campaign about a Palestinian seat, I mean, many people asked me, why didn't you do a campaign for, uh, uh, for, a, for a popular committee, like to have a more transparent popular committee in the camp? But my idea was, that, I mean, Palestinians need to have their basic rights first. They need to be able to, to be educated, to work, to have a normal life, uh, to, like, to, have a free, uh, to, to be free, uh, to have a freedom of movement. And then, and because many camps are closed, and I mean, it's very hard to go in and out from the camp. So they need to have their basic rights so they can build their own individ their individual identity. So then they can think about their political collective identity, because they will never, ever be able to think about political collective identity if they don't have a healthy individual identity. Yet... That's why, I mean, having, a, like, advocating for popular committee, maybe Palestinians, they don't want popular committee. Maybe they don't want to be in camps. So let them get their basic rights. That they, give, they give them the freedom of choosing what do they want. So they will be able to decide on what, uh, what political uh, uh, leadership they want. So that's, that's, why, uh, that's why, I mean, it was very important to say uh, that Palestinians need to have the right in Lebanon, even if the, the state is dysfunctional, yet, I mean, let them as individuals have an opportunity, have equal opportunity. At least, at least they can, they can build a safety net and they can build, uh, I mean, safety net for, for their peers, Palestinians, to help them. At least they can have opportunity outside Lebanon. For example, the Gulf doesn't take, uh, doesn't allow Palestinian refugees from Lebanon to go and work there. So we need to work on giving them opportunity. And drive, basically. Unfortunately, there is no development, and it doesn't seem to be, in, uh, I mean, very soon, because it's a very uh, controversial uh, and very politicized topic in Lebanon, uh, just because, I mean, based on what Lebanese politicians fear and what they say, uh, that more Lebanese women tend to be married with Muslims than with Christians. So that's why. So they always fear the unbalanced security, the, the security and balance to be threatened in Lebanon. And yes, I mean, uh, personally, uh, identity is so complex, and it changed with, with time. For example, when I was studying in Tunisia, because I studied in Tunisia, Palestinians there, they were looking at me as Lebanese. And I did feel that I'm Lebanese there, uh, based on the culture, based on a lot of things. Uh, Yet, sometimes you feel like 
People ask me, are you 50, 50, 70, 30? How do you feel? It's not a percentage. I mean, sometimes you feel you are completely Palestinian when it's when, I mean, you feel that your identity is threatened and you want to prove something, and sometimes you feel like you're completely Lebanese. So it's not a percentage. It's a just, um, it's, it's, it's multiple identity that you, that enrich my personality and that I'm, I enjoy living with all those identities. So, uh, so, but yes, I mean, unfortunately, and for me, it's also a, a like, uh, uh, more complex issue because my mom is Christian and my dad is Muslim. So my like my mom cannot I cannot inherit from my mom and my mom cannot inherit from me because of the the difference in religion. Because I'm on on my identity, I'm uh, like my identity card. I'm Muslim and my mom is Christian. So that's why there is a real need to have a civil law in Lebanon when it comes to personal status. In addition to women, because when women are not giving, I, like, um, they don't have the right to give um, the citizenship for their children, it affects their right of choice. Because it, it's like telling them you have no right to choose your husband because you will be limited with the consequences. So this is, I mean, the, like, the horrible uh, uh, consequences of not giving the nationality. It's just not to tell them that you're not a full citizen. You're, you're, you're not equal to the man, but also we are limiting your choice to choose your, your partner or your, your husband. So it's, it's a very complex, and it's so unfortunate when you hear a lot of Lebanese women defending that argument. Because also, I mean, we need to, I mean, also when it comes to, to gender equality, it's not about being free, it's not about wearing a short skirt or not having a veil or whatever. It's also about like your right to to uh, to the custody, it's only all those things that people they don't feel. It's only those who suffer who feel this. But but I mean that's why it's 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 very urgent to have uh, a civil law in Lebanon and not a sectarian law. I, I think the, the core issue here, and it is true so many issues for UNRWA, is that it, it, it is very difficult and costly for the organization to get too far out ahead of post government. So if post governments don't want to see the change, it would be a major political fight with those post governments to make the change. Now, if there was enormous pressure, because when we say the UN, there's, there's not we really mean UN member states. I mean, the UN can't do anything unless lots of powerful UN member states are agreed. So, you know, perhaps if there were powerful donor countries who were very upset about these kinds of issues, then you might get some change. But I'm not sure donors really want to expand service eligibility, right? They, they already think that there are too many people eligible for UNRWA services, that UNRWA is not sustainable in the longer term, and that it needs to shrink and target its, its beneficiary numbers. So I can't see why donors would would make that a 
a major concern. So UNRWA cannot engage in a big fight with major host countries or with host countries unless there's – it can say, oh, look at all the pressure coming from, from abroad or our funding is conditional or what have you. Other than that, it would, it would prefer to just simply avoid, avoid the fight because it's not a fight it, can, it, it, it will win in, unless – Either the host countries want to change policy or there's enormous pressure on the host countries. And certainly no, no donor is going to sit down with the Jordanians and on the list of diplomatic things they want to talk to the Jordanian government about have the status of female Palestinian refugees. <laughs> I mean, there'll be counterterrorism, Iran, Arab-Israeli conflict, Jordanian development, blah, 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 blah. You'd have to go down an extraordinarily long list before – any major donor would have that issue that they would raise bilaterally with the Jordanians, and the Jordanians, the last thing they want is to increase the number of people who are who form or considered Palestinian refugees in Jordan. <laughs> Jordan's a country that's so sensitive that they, they never release their census number on how many people are Palestinian. So um, we like the sensitivities in, in, in Lebanon, but for, for different reasons. So I think it's just very hard. And that's one issue. Another example where this is a problem is, is education systems, right? UNRWA is constantly in trouble for educational materials, which in many cases they're not writing because they try to use host country educational materials, but they don't actually control what's in host country uh, educational material. So, so the host countries have a lot of influence over what UNRWA doesn't do. In some cases, influence over what it does do, but they have a lot of influence over what UNRWA doesn't do. They absolutely hurt for two reasons. Now, I have to say, most donors who are most involved with UNRWA, so that is to say in the parts of foreign ministry or aid agencies who work with UNRWA, absolutely recognize the terrific work that, that is done. You know, and, and they will spend a lot of effort trying to defend the organization within their own countries and with their own, within their own institutions. However, the corruption scandals, or it was more a nepotism influence scandal with, with former uh, um, Commissioner General, um, Pierre Cannibal, uh, those hurt for two reasons. Uh, the donors have always not been entirely happy with UNRWA's management processes. So when the scandal like this comes up, it just simply reinforces the view that the agency could be better run. Secondly, and I think in some ways even more important, um, you know, diplomats or aid officials who spend a lot of time trying to defend UNRWA against its critics in their own country or against Israel, suddenly find the floor pulled from beneath them when there's a major corruption scandal in UNRWA. Because everyone who's critical of the agency says, we told you it's a terribly corrupt agency. Now, the fact that 98% of UNRWA employees might be doing their jobs without any corruption is kind of irrelevant in those debates. It provides ammunition to UNRWA's critics. And not surprisingly, what donors then do is they insist on more and more things UNRWA has to do in order to get money, which is how we get back to this new U.S. UNRWA framework agreement. The Americans, the Biden administration, has said, okay, we think the Trump administration was wrong to cut off funding. We're going to provide funding again, but this is really sensitive for us. This is really difficult for us. There's a lot of people in Congress in both political parties who think we shouldn't be funding UNRWA. And so we're going to require you do all these things to help protect us against our domestic critics. So some of the things that UNRWA has to do is the, the, the donors worried about their own political liabilities for supporting UNRWA. So when a scandal like this erupts, it just makes the agency, it makes it easy to attack the agency. It becomes easy to exaggerate it. I mean, UNRWA, educational achievement of, of kids in UNRWA schools in, in, in Palestine are better than the educational achievement of kids in school in the Gulf. 
You can imagine how much more Qatar spends per student than UNRWA does, and yet on standardized global tests, Palestinian school kids do better. It's remarkable, many of the things UNRWA does, but it has a lot of people who'd like it to go away. It has its own internal problems, and when those scandals occur, I think it, I think it's really problematic. Now, the beneficial side might be whistleblower protections, greater accountability, you know, uh, ethical standards. So there are positives when a scandal erupts in terms of organizational reform, but it certainly empowers the critics of UNRWA. Well, I, I mean, not to be sarcastic, but I would say maybe people in the camp would care much more about uh, if uh, UNRWA doesn't secure water or if, or if UNRWA would hold accountable a teacher that belongs to Hamas or to Fatah, they would make a bigger st a scandal to dealing with that than when there is a corruption uh, report uh, about the agency, just to, to put it this way. So talking about the, this um, corruption report, I mean, uh, Based, uh, we know that, I mean, those things happen and uh, can happen in, in many institutions. Uh, but, this is, but such reports give an excuse for those donors who doesn't want to support UNRWA. It's an easy excuse to say, oh, uh, they have a corruption scandal, so, I mean, let's not support them. Yet, I mean, such a scandal would, would I mean, could be, could be, uh, um, could be used to, to build better accountability inside the agency uh, and the ownership. Uh, because for me, I mean, how I see UNRWA, it's uh, definitely UNRWA is an agency uh, for making Palestinians survive, but definitely not thrive. So it's time to think about what can be done after 74 years. What are the standards for UNRWA services now? Should we talk about standards for UNRWA services after 74 years? And with like less funding, those services are degrading, even, even are not keeping the, the same level, they are degrading. So after 74 years, I mean, do, I mean, like, let's, let's see if we are uh, getting close to international standards when it comes to uh, to, to providing services for Palestinian refugees. Also, I would, I would definitely see, like, what is the organizational culture that UNRWA is providing for Palestinians? Because you have 3,000 Palestinians working in, in UNRWA, almost around 3,000. Those 3,000 3, Palestinians, they go back to their house. What, I mean, what is, what is, uh, what, what culture they, they bring them with them when it comes to accountability, to, uh, to ownership, to democracy. So all of those for me, I mean, UNRWA can, can play an important role when it comes to building a new uh, democratic culture or uh, participation for, for Palestinians. Uh, that's how I see that UNRWA role should, uh, should be looked at. It's okay it's for, and also how, how not to be co-opted by the faction. It's very important. And in Lebanon, we see a lot of times that, I mean, accountability stops when UNRWA would, like, want to, to deal with, uh, with any employee who, uh, who, who belongs to, to any faction. Also, this is very important. That, I mean, it's, it's really, we have a lot, a lot of questions that UNRWA needs to deal with uh, from an internal perspective. Definitely for this, they need to, to have funding, I mean, that's for sure, that's a different different story. Uh, but also, I mean, UNRWA needs leadership as well. 